Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to our special webinar on challenges to global anti-Black racism, a conversation. This particular webinar is a joint program of Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and the Watson Institute, but it's also part of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice's broader program, This is America, a series of conversations about racial slavery, its legacies, and anti-Black racism. I just want to say briefly that for me today, the conversation really underscores four beliefs. The first is that while every place, including the United States, has unique features, America's anti-Black racism is part of a broader global phenomenon, and it's been so for centuries. It's a reflection of global systems that really have extended back um, for many years and really for, for centuries. Second, as a global phenomenon, anti-Black racism needs to be studied and challenged from a variety of different perspectives and collaborative efforts, whether here in the United States or abroad. This isn't a time for boundary, boundaries and siloed studies. The Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, CSSJ, and, and Watson's collaboration is but an example of the kind of interdisciplinary and interunit study that really has to happen. And I thank my colleague, Tony Bogues, the director of CSSJ, for, for being such a great leader in these efforts. Third, we have so much to learn from broader networks of colleagues across the globe, um, several of whom are represented today. I'm so grateful to those who are participating today and, and those beyond who've educated me and all of us here at Brown. Um, I also want to say that this conversation today and, and into the future needs to bring together as many voices and perspectives as possible. We have so much to learn from one another, especially our audience. So I thank you all in the audience for participating today, and um, I look forward to your questions and comments. Now let me turn it over to my friend and colleague and, and teacher, uh, Tony Bogues, Professor of Africana Studies and also the Director of Brown University Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Tony. Thank you very, very much, Ed. Um, the, I want to, of course, welcome everybody uh, to, this, uh, to this webinar and wherever you are uh, in the world. This is the third webinar in the CSSJ series uh, called This is America. And as Ed said, the title of this one is Challenges to Global Black Anti-Racism, A Conversation. I'm Tony Bogues, um, and I will be your host and moderator for this program. This particular series that we have developed at the CSSJ is really a platform about in which we hope we can debate, hold conversations and discussions, not just around the histories of racial slavery and how that has shaped the present and the structural legacies of anti-Black racism, but we also want to pay some attention to the movements against anti-Black racism. And in doing this, we ask some of the, some of the following questions. What are the horizons of these movements against anti-Black racism? What are their demands? And how do they invite us to build a different world? The series, This is America, will be driven by various questions that are currently raised by the complex movements against anti-Black racism, not just in America, but globally. So in the near future, we will have webinar on monuments, we are planning a program in which curators and artists will engage in conversations and debate about what does it mean to curate in this present moment. We are at Brown University and that is in Rhode Island and that's where, we, that's where some of us live. And so we will also have a program on the activism in the state of Rhode Island. There will also be a webinar on the future of black politics. These are just some of the future programs. So as we say, watch this space. The format of this program is simple. I will introduce the speakers who will have opening remarks for say no longer than seven minutes. I will then ask a few questions and then turn it over to you, the participants and audience. The questions will be, will be collected by, uh, through the Q&A uh, function, which we ask you to use, and then asked by a member of our staff. 
My apologies in advance if we do not have time to answer your question, since in fact there are going to be hundreds of you on this webinar, so we might not get to everybody. So now, after finishing all these housekeeping matters, let us proceed. For over a month, the New York Times tells us, some 26 million people protested under the banner Black Lives Matter. I think we can safely say that this then was a historic moment, made even more remarkable because it happened in the midst of a global COVID pandemic. But it was not just in America that people marched and protested. They did so in the Netherlands, in London, in Paris, in Scotland, in Australia, in New Zealand, Brazil, parts of the Caribbean, to name some places. In other words, we witnessed for the first time in many, many years, a kind of global movement against anti-Black racism. Many monuments that signified the history of racial slavery and colonialism came tumbling down. And some like that of Ed Colston, the slave trader from Bristol, England, were symbolically drowned. So here we have a historic moment, one in which was catalyzed by the protests against the modern day lynching of George Floyd. In our attempt to understand this global historic moment, the CSSJ in collaboration with the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs have gathered a set of number of persons from around the world to talk about anti-Black racism in their specific countries, to think in a set of conversations, hopefully, about what does it mean, this, what does anti-Black racism mean globally and in their countries, and also to talk about the struggles against it. To take us on this global journey, we have the following persons. Jerry Augusto. Jerry Augusto is a associate professor at the Watson Institute and the director of development studies program. She lived and worked for many years in Southern Africa and more recently has been deeply involved in collaborative projects in South Africa and Brazil. Michel Cias is an activist and campaigner. He is the co-founder of the remarkable political cultural space in Amsterdam, the Black Archives, and has led campaigns against Zorte Piet in the Netherlands. He was one of the organizers of the recent solidarity demonstrations in support of Black Lives Matter in Amsterdam. These demonstrations have been called some of the largest protests in the Netherlands for some many years. Françoise Verges is a public educator based in Paris. She's an anti-racist, decolonial feminist, and the co-founder of the association Decolonize the Arts. She has written on memories of slavery, colonial slavery, decolonial feminism, Franz Fanon, and Amy Césaire. Between 2008 and 2012, she was the president of the National Committee for the History and Memory of Slavery in France. Zandra Yeman is a major campaigner against anti-Black racism. In Scotland, she is a community and campaigns officer for the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights based, based in Glasgow. Zandra works with partners and community members, organizing networks, training, as well as Black History Month in Scotland. She is leading the campaign for the creation of the National Museum of Empire, Slavery, Colonialism, and Migration that is to be built in Scotland. Wilton, Wilson Mattis is the professor of history and the theory, professor of the theory of history and historiography at the State University of Bahia in Brazil. He is currently the coordinator of Afro Uniped, an interdisciplinary program for the study of Africa and Afro Brazilian societies. He is also the secretary of the Association of Black Brazilian Researchers. Welcome all to these panelists. Welcome again to you, the audience. And now we will begin our conversation with Jerry Augusto. Jerry. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll start by paying respects to our ancestors, the many thousands gone here in the United States, in Brazil, in Europe, and elsewhere, in the long stretch of history marked by colonialism, slavery, and the afterlives of both. 
since I'm speaking from Providence on lands that were theirs, those ancestors to whom I wish to pay respect also include the Narragansett and the Wampanoag. Included also are those ancestors I was taught in Africa to consider as the near ones, the more recently gone, among whom are George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Marielle Franco, Mike Ben Peter, Adama Traore, Chantel Moore, and the many victimized disproportionately by COVID-19 because they were Afro-descendant, Latinx, indigenous, workers in jobs suddenly called essential, or indeed those who lived at the intersection of all of these. We should not forget that these were human lives and that their loss is a human one. And so we must extend our deepest condolences to their families and community. Today, I don't wanna speak about or on behalf of those most actively engaged right now in anti-racism work in different parts of the world. Rather, I want to try to speak, as filmmaker Trin Min Ha has put it, nearby. As an African-American raised in a home of freedom fighters and a person who subsequently led a very transnational Black life, I can only, with a deep dose of humility, offer a few reflections, put in some questions. But after that, I want to hear much more from our global guests. I'll use my time to do just two things, give it our attention not just to the audacity and the tremendous unparalleled mobilizing power of recent protests, but also to the ideas that the activists, especially Afro-descendants, are experimenting with and working through. And secondly, I want to underline how the circulation, reconfiguration, and transformation of ideas, symbols, and practices is and long has been part of a global Black tradition. It is a tradition that is intellectual, yes, and radical, often enough, change the very course of history. It includes an almost uninterrupted flow of Black people across the waters and up and down continents under duress or self-propelled. The late Barbadian historian and poet Kamal Brathwaite called all this dynamic interconnectedness of African and African diasporic communities, imaginaries, ideas, and people, this resonance idolectics. Solidarity, speaking nearby, listening nearby, acting nearby, often in ordinary ways to give support, is part of the Black radical tradition, one of its strongest impulses. The concerns have always crossed borders, from Toussaint Louverture as a rousing symbol for Black soldiers in the U.S. Civil War, to African-American anti-fascist volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, from the reverberations of defiant South African protest against the 1960 Sharpeville Massacre, to Black power endlessly reinvented from Lowndes County, Alabama, to Jamaica, to New Zealand. From Claudia Jones's organizing against women's triple oppression in Harlem and London, to Steve Biko's Black consciousness resurfacing in Brazil's Movimento Negro Unificado. From Luisa Bajos and Leia Gonzalez out of Brazil, mobilizing a transnational Black feminism across all the Americas. Perhaps we should not be so surprised that Black sportspersons of all kinds on all kinds of playing fields are taking a knee in honor of George Floyd. Nowadays, this exchange of ideas is digital and rapid. But what might also be important right now is more direct conversation among those who are leading struggles against systemic racism, mass caging of people of color, and the structural causes of inequality in different countries. These mainly young thinker doers, and to know more about their platforms and public agendas taking them seriously in their own words. They're recreating what social movement organizing inside and out looks like. What could we learn from more critical conversations, not just about the what, the how, but the where from and the why of all this? I'm thinking about polyvalent ideas such as abolition being defined and put into new practice in more than one place, in the USA and Brazil and elsewhere. The historical roots of the arguments may be found in slavery, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism, of course, in all the Americas. But they also lie in the afterlives of colonialism in many European countries and in Africa itself. What might real conversations about those various paths to struggle ideas and aims resonate with the same words but having multiple meanings? And what can we learn from conversations that frame not just a pandemic, but rather what some of us think of as a syndemic, connected historical struggle traumas and structures underpinning social harm that sometimes include both anti-Black and gender violence. How might something called, for example, the BREATHE Act reverberate and get reinterpreted globally? How might we conjugate racism and colonialism 
within the fall of King Leopold's statue in Belgium or Onyate's statue in Mexico. I want to offer two examples of ideas articulated in the words of younger activists themselves. I think you'll see how they're interconnected and might be generative of a deeper global conversation. The first I borrow from an ongoing intergenerational conversation in which I've been participating over the last few years between elders in the SNCC Legacy Project and some leaders from the Movement for Black Lives who work in a range of community-based organizations. Part of that conversation is just sharing but it has also been about creating histories of social movements from the inside out, from sources which historian Kelly Little Hernandez has called rebel archives. The second set of ideas is from the brilliant Afro-Brazilian city councilwoman from Rio de Janeiro, Marielle Franco, slain two years ago in an act of state violence. From the movement for Black Lives Interlocutors, I will just share a few particularly striking quotes. First quote, I am part of a continuum. We are part of it. Second quote, ours is a connected up struggle, anti-racism, economic justice, the inequities of COVID-19, police violence against black people. We cannot win economic justice without racial justice. Third quote, you know, the size and scale of who knows what's happening is larger than ever before. And so are the number of people who can do something. Fourth quote, we're working our way from symbolic organizing and campaigns to a tighter organizing that speaks to the moment. People are thinking of housing, transportation, healthcare, the environment. How should we be organizing around concerns that speak to the moment, that speak to what people in communities are thinking? Fifth quote, we have less tolerance for the classism, sexual politics, and homophobia that existed in past struggle formations. We're less prescriptive in terms of who Young people are demanding and fighting for what they want the future to look like, not limited by past betrayals or past failures. Sixth quote, we can't go back to what existed. We're going to build a new future. What will that look like? I don't know, but I think it will be about life, work, safety, end quotes. For many in the Americas, Marielle Franco represented, among other things, the fierce intelligent leadership that Black women including lesbians like herself from working class communities are brought to the current moment, but not as well known outside of Brazil as they should be are her ideas. I want to show a quick slide and perhaps we'll return to this later in the conversation. I can do it fast. If I can't, I'll skip. Okay, I can't get it to share. What I will explain is that Marielle Franco, before she was killed, managed to submit a master's degree uh, thesis and it was on policing and the police state and mass incarceration in the favelas where she lived and from which she campaigned and won election and it's a remarkable set of ideas not yet translated from the portuguese to the english but it was almost prescient in foreseeing some of the questions about what does public safety really look like what does it mean when social policy is turned into a militant military occupation of communities? And what would it mean to think about a city like Rio de Janeiro as the whole city? She called it a cidade do seu conjunto. It's a very remarkable set of ideas that I think have a lot to do with, there she is, there's Marielle, there's the thesis, and which has a lot to do to contribute, I think, to radical anti-racist thought and practice and right on point with some of the issues that we're considering today. With that, I look forward to listening nearby to all that my fellow panelists have to say and learning more about that broader report and those multiplied meanings of global anti-racism now. Thank you. Okay, so I think it's uh, my turn to speak. I'm uh, gonna share my screen as well. I prepared a uh, presentation. Yes, can everybody see it? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to uh, yeah join this uh, seminar. Uh, there have been only been two speakers, but it's already very inspiring. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Mitchell Esayas. I'm born and bred in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, part my uh, parents and family are from Suriname, former Dutch colony in South America and Caribbean. 
and uh, I'm co-founder of the Black Archives, which is a archive um, or a cultural center uh, around Black histories in the Dutch context, which is of course part of a larger radical Black tradition. Um, besides, and I'm also co-founder of New Urban Collective Network for Black students and young professionals, uh, and I'm also part of uh, Kick Out Sweater Pit, which is a action group uh, protesting anti-racism and I've been part of organizing the Black Lives Matter protests in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, of the past few weeks. So to give you a little bit of context about what happened here, um, on June 1st uh, I co-organized together with uh, a few other activists a or the first Black Lives Matter protest in this year um, on the Dam Square in Amsterdam. And over the past few years, there have been several protests. I'll show a few slides later on. Um, but those were mostly focused on a specific racist tradition in the Netherlands, which we call uh, yeah, Santa Claus. In the Dutch context, Santa Claus doesn't come with elves, but with black beads, which are played by white people in blackface. And over the past few years, that movement against this tradition, which is a symbol of underlying institutional racism, has grown uh, from just a handful of people to um, about seven to 800 last year, which was the biggest turnout um, in this century. So we announced this protest on May 31st, one day before June 1st. Um, with the idea or the expectation that maybe, you know, if everything would go well, maybe a thousand or 1500 people would show up. Um, on this slide, you can see that it were a bit more than 1500 people. Uh, in fact, uh, estimates show that about 14 to 15,000 people showed up within one day. And the fact that so many people showed up at a protest um, in the context of this global pandemic where there were all kinds of uh, regulations shows that many people felt that um, the modern day lynching of George Floyd was an issue that had to be addressed. But a lot of people also showed up because they know, they feel, they experience that anti-black racism is a big problem uh, in the Netherlands as well. So this was the first of a series of protests um, across the country throughout the month. Um, several protests took place in every province uh, from Amsterdam to Rotterdam to the north and the south of the Netherlands. And that is quite exceptional for the Dutch context. Um, usually protests against racism, as I said, don't attract that many people and it's usually focused on the big cities or the city where these racist traditions uh, take place. Um, however, uh, last month, more than 50,000 people joined the protest. And yeah, you can see a few pictures here. This was a second one in Amsterdam, but then in Amsterdam Southeast, which is the uh, yeah, black neighborhood of Amsterdam. Even children organized a protest. Uh, in Demon, uh, which is near Amsterdam. A few school children that experienced racism as well decided they wanted to do it as well. Um, and in this context, it you know, sparked a large debate around colonial monuments uh, uh, and artifacts, such as we saw in other countries as well. And when we look at the Dutch context, there's one uh, concept I'd like to share because of the, you know, the time that I have. And there's a concept of white innocence uh, written about by Gloria Wecker, uh, anthropologist. And what she argues is that what you see in the Dutch context is that, um, yeah, Dutch people tend to see themselves as, you know, one of the most open and tolerant nations in the world, you know, standing for equality and, and, and liberalism. However, on the other hand, it's also been one of the major colonial powers, as I think uh, a lot of you know. Um, 
But because of this dominant self-image of openness, tolerance, and equality, yeah, the other side, that legacy of slavery, that legacy of colonialism and imperialism is often uh, denied or disavowed. And so issues such as racism are, have long been a taboo, uh, let alone the specific form of anti-Black racism. So over the past 10 years, you know, the movement has really been focused on getting people to acknowledge that there's such a thing as racism, let alone, you know, work on uh, uh, solutions. So what we try to do through our work at the Black Archives is show that there is a, uh, a history of different forms of institutional racism and anti-Blackness. Uh, documents that we have showed that there's a long history of police violence, as these pictures and the documents show, but also a history of black emancipation movements. And this is a picture from the 1970s, where you see people uh, getting together, and uh, the Black Panther on the background on the flag, showing that connection uh, with uh, black solidarity movements. Um, a few things that I noticed over the past months, one thing that was very different was that uh, the number of people grew exponentially, but also the kind of people were not just black people, but we saw a lot of solidarity from different groups of people, people of color, white people speaking up, writing about it in uh, media, talking about it openly. And that's a big difference uh, compared to the past years. This is what happened last year. I joined a protest, not even a protest, a meeting, and a few uh, fascists tried to attack us, and this was my car. They smashed my car. Uh, it was completely demolished. Um, this was the biggest protest until now, uh, 700 people last year in November. And this is an example of the blackface tradition that we've been protesting against. So we've seen a big difference. Even the Dutch soccer team made a statement when on the national program, someone made a racist comment. And usually, you know, in the Dutch context, people say, hey, you know, it's just a joke, don't fuss about it. But for the first time, people spoke up, even Dutch uh, sportsmen uh, co-organized a boycott of this program, which led to the program being canceled. And I'm wrapping it up, because I'm short on time. Um, what's also interesting is that um, we've been invited by several politicians, the, the prime minister, uh, the mayors of Amsterdam and Rotterdam uh, and a few other places to engage in a conversation about what, you know, what to do next. And it's the first time that the prime minister acknowledged that there is such a thing as institutional racism. So what we aim to do in the coming period is that we want to, uh, we said, you know, we're a people's movement. Before we're going to talk with these politicians, we want to talk to the people first. So the aim is to develop a manifesto uh, based on the input that we gather uh, with or during these uh, meetings with our, you know, our movement, with the people, and based on that we want to talk uh, with, with, with all kinds of stakeholders. Um, besides that, there have been some other developments as well, uh, but because of time, I'll keep it at this, and maybe we can address it during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Micha. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening. Well, thank you for inviting me uh, for that conversation. Uh, just uh, perhaps a word uh, to begin with, as you know, like the other. Um, I come from Reunion Island. This is a very important point because it's a, a colony established by the French in the Indian Ocean with uh, slaves, uh, slavery, and then uh, colonial status, and it's today one of the overseas territories. And I grew up with, uh, my parents were anti-colonial activists and feminists and, and communists, and you know, were sent to jail. So this is for me really the matrix of my activism. This is where I, I saw racism first and, and in fact still a colonial uh, setting. So the, the idea that France is still a colonial state is very, it's, it's, it's clear to me. There has never been a doubt. That's one, uh, one of the first things. The second thing I would like to say that uh, uh, I always quite often use uh, what Amy Césaire called the boomerang effect of slavery and colonialism in discourse on colonialism. When he explained that uh, any country which enslave and colonize will see things 
returning to itself. You cannot have racial laws over there and innocence here. It will come back, it will contaminate even the progressive uh, movement. And that has been very important because the left in, in France has been very reluctant to see how it has been itself racist. So the notion of structural racism, of institutional systemic racism is very difficult to uh, uh, understand for this, you know, the, the progressive movement, feminism, political party, union have been really, uh, in fact, quite racist and they don't want to see that. Uh, a second point, so this I think we are witnessing the moment when this boomerang effect is very clear now for more and more people and this being acted upon. The second point I would like to say that in France we have to also, I mean I'm talking about France even though I don't consider myself a French, it's, it's multi-space, it's very important because quite often France is being seen as you know this little country in Europe but it has a lot of overseas territory. And this is very important because this territory are from the slavery and post-slavery colonial empire. This is Martinique and Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, uh, Guyana in South America, uh, Kanake, uh, New Caledonia, and the island of the Pacific in the Pacific, and Mayotte and Reno in the Indian Ocean. I say it's very important because it's a, the, the, the way in which black lives do not matter, in fact, is being played perhaps differently on a different level in these different territories. So there is similarities, the fact that effectively black lives do not matter in, in any of this territory, and nonetheless differences. It's very important to understand that. Uh, and, and by the way, I want to uh, insist on, 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 on one thing. It was in Martinique on May 22nd of this year that the first statue fall, fell, sorry. It was a statue of Victor Schelcher, who was the iconic, you know, Republican figure of French abolitionism. And two young women came to the camera and, and claimed, you know, uh, uh, that it was their doing. And they explained that Victor Schelcher was not the savior and they connected the, the the kind of abolition that the French imposed, not only, of, of course, by, you know, uh, paying the slave owner for the loss of the property, but the kind of uh, dependency that the French state has instituted to this day. And this connection they made, and they made it not through a slave owner figure, but through the abolitionist. And they pointed very clearly how republicanism French republicanism has been effectively contaminated by, you know, if we follow again, Amy Césaire. But that's very important that the statue that fell in Martinique, and they were the first, I mean, has been erased by the fall of Colson in Bristol, which happened only in June. And so this also erasure is very, uh, it's an important point for me. You know, what, where it matter, where the action matter. And the, the question of uh, the anti-racist struggle in the overseas territory has a different, of course, aspect than in France proper, and it's very quite often uh, erased. So um, that multi-space is, is quite important also in terms of the kind of discrimination, uh, rate of poverty, uh, rate of mortality. I mean, for instance, in Martinique, the rate of infant mortality is three times higher and in France proper. So this thing uh, we have to, to keep in mind. Um, the, the third point I would like to make is the, the struggle in France right now, our social struggle with a lot of uh, uh, what we call the black vest, and uh, not the yellow vest, but the black vest, who are uh, African uh, migrant workers who are fighting for their right and against racism, even though they are illegal, they come out. Uh, a lot of strikes are so by uh, um, cleaning uh, women of African origin, and this is very important because they are challenging the way unions see uh, cleaning and caring. Uh, there is also the, the movement in the cultural world with uh, actors and actresses complaining about the fact of the question of representation, but the decolonization of the museum, the movement following, you know, the uh, need for the restitution of stolen object to uh, Africa, to the country of Africa. So this is the, and around this movement, it's this idea of political anti-racism rather than moral anti-racism, and is also in some place connected with decolonial 
theory. A lot of the, the notion of decolonization is very coming back very strongly. Decolonizing knowledge, decolonizing art, decolonize uh, you know, the public space also uh, with some intervention of one statue in France. Uh, I, I you know, organized some of them uh, in Paris in, uh, in June. The, the, the third point, I mean, which is emerging also in France is all this question around health. And as was said uh, before, uh, of course, we saw with the pandemic the highest rate of mortality among, you know, black and poor uh, uh, people in France. And, uh, and this is connected also with all this other form of violence. It's not just, you know, the, 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 the question of who effectively, uh, what Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore has called the vulner vulnerability to premature death. And this is also what has been a, a, a focus through the question of police violence, but also injustice, inequality, the question of health and education. And also the ecological question, because of, again, Martin Tink and Guadeloupe there was a pesticide used long after it was forbidden in France, and this means the highest rate of, uh, of uh, cancer and uh, the soil being polluted for generation. So the question of anti-blackness is not just if it is through the question of police violence only, but also seen through that. And the turning point, if I want to give like an historical moment, it was two, uh, 2005 when uh, Ziad Bena and uh, Buna Traoré were killed, uh, you know, uh, were, because they were uh, escaping the police. And it was followed by a huge social riot. And this was a turning point in terms of police violence, governmental policy, and also the emerging of a new anti-racist movement, uh, political uh, anti-racist movement. So the recent marches and demonstrations rest upon this long history of anti-racist struggle in France, even though uh, France hide it against its uh, supposed, uh, you know, universalism of this belief that equality is for all, despite the fact that, you know, they demonstrate uh, inequalities every day. Um, in terms of uh, the recent marches for in June, on June 2, 2 20,000 people uh, for justice and, and truth for Adama Traoré, one of the young people young black people who have been killed. Because in fact, in France, very few murder by the police violence have been resolved. I mean, they, they are not even, you know, they don't even arrive to the tribunal. Uh, and this is, uh, this, so this uh, movement, uh, these uh, marches have been connected with what's happening, of course, in the United States. But um, it, it's important because in France, uh, the government is, uh, is attacking the anti-racist movement by saying you are imitating the United States. So uh, in fact, we are not thinking by ourselves, we are just imitating, we don't know, you know what we are saying or whatever. And so it's important to retrace also the, uh, as, as, as uh, Tony Bowes was saying at the, at the beginning, uh, the, both the global aspect of anti-blackness and, and also the specificity. And France uh, is absolutely, it's not even what uh, like the mayor of Amsterdam or the prime minister of the Netherlands, not even pretending to listen to us. On the contrary, the government just announced that it will study a law uh, to criminalize uh, what they call separatism any, any uh, move, organization or the movement that is see as threatening the Republic, the value and the principle of Republican France. So it's, it's, um, I, I, it, it's a very, I do think it's a historical moment. It will all, um, and all the connection of this different uh, violence, form of violence, ecological, health, jobs, housing, police violence, sexism, rape, torture, imprisonment, uh, we are coming together. And that's a very, that's really something that is being discussed. There was a lot of conversation. I'm, I will not say it's all harmonious, but there is a conversation in there. Uh, but I, I will, I, I'm, I have to say that I'm, I'm thinking of what is coming and the fall and in the fall when um, we are expecting in, in very brutal 
impoverishment, a lot of loss of jobs. And we know that the first uh, people who will be targeted, who will be the victim of this job loss and, and the poverty will be the black people and, the, uh, and also the non, all the non-white people in France who constitute, in, uh, according to the National uh, Center of Demographics, 30% of the whole French population. 30% of the French population is non-white. And, um, so, and, and this will be connected also with the incredible Islamophobia in France, which is absolutely hysterical. The first law, in fact, was against the veil in the, in the late uh, 1980s. And it was announcing what, what we are seeing today. So both incredible uh, historical moment with a lot of young people. And again, as in Holland and everywhere, very diverse, uh, very young, a lot of queer, young queer people, a lot of young women. That's very important. But the tradition of French universalism is also a very strong tradition that does not want absolutely to talk about race. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Can we move to Zandra, please? Um, so thank you, um, Professor Bogues and the organisers for inviting me along to speak today. It's a really great opportunity actually to ha be part of a global conversation, um, particularly coming from Scotland because we never really considered. We are, we're put as part of the UK, which is important, but actually when you think about Scotland's um, complicit and direct involvement within empire, slavery and colonialism, um, it's really important that we have the opportunity to put across what the state of um, racial inequality is and anti-black racism within our own um, country. But to give um, some more context of the struggles that we have in Scotland, so between the years of 2000 and 2013, there was 10 murders with a known or suspected racist element that were recorded with many having little, if any, media interest at all. All too often these were seen as one-off incidents rather than any broader reflection on Scottish society. Yet during this period, these 10 cases gave Scotland a higher per capita rate of murder associated with racism than other parts of the UK, such as England or Wales. Here I'm using an image of a young man, Sheikho Bayo, who's from Fife, a town in Scotland. Sheikho was a son, a brother, a partner, father and a friend. And Sheikho's family are dealing with the unjust and unacceptably slow progress towards a public inquiry into his death in police custody, which happened five years ago. Seeing the impact of the protests in the United States, I think it was difficult as every media outlet was talking about racism and state-sanctioned violence in the United States, ignoring things that are happening here on our own doorstep. And I should also point out the, the image that I'm using um, of Sheikho, which is a pretty harrowing image, but this is the image the family wanted me to use, and also um, it was passed on by the Sheikho Bios family lawyer. Um, but the upsurge of black voices and the current protests have created a platform to highlight these issues, but only while people are looking and only while they want to look. A strategic organisation like ours, whose work relies on often blunt dialogue with policymakers, the sea change in the past month has been emotional and, to be honest, slightly baffling. We have not made ourselves pop very popular over the years. Our insistence that racism and racial inequality are ever present in Scotland's structures and institutions is not to everyone's taste. What has often happened is our policymakers have taken a colourblind approach and the idea that there is such a thing as anti-blackness um, being a concept is something that they don't even want to consider. So the task ahead is for us to turn symbolism and protests and conversations into real change. 
Um, and one of the things that we did where we were taking this time were the gaze of our politicians and our policymakers and the people within power were paying attention. We, we did um, contact all the politicians and um, our first minister and published a letter asking for five achievable asks. Um, those asks include things about um, looking at fair representation within employment, um, looking at how we are, you know, the fact that we omit our history and Scotland's involvement within empire, slavery, colonialism, um, and our diverse communities, how long they have been around. These are things that we have pushed in the agenda that we are teaching these histories in our schools in their unvarnished truth. Um, and also we've asked for some help towards a scoping exercise to fund our museum. Um, and I, I recognise that some people might struggle to see what these pen pushing exercises have to do with the Black Lives Matter movement and the violence that makes it necessary. The truth is, for us, they are undeniably part of the same thread. Deaths caused by racism are not always physically violent. They can also be what some people think of as mundane things, like lack of opportunity, poverty, overcrowded housing, and the strain on mental health can and do kill. Structural racism and everyday discrimination are a quiet and insidious form of violence. So next week and the week after, and the week after that, we'll still be making these demands and we'll keep making them until they're agreed and achieved. And in all honesty, at times anti-racism, as you know, you know, the laborious task behind that work can be extremely boring, but it certainly doesn't have to be lonely. And that's why having opportunities where we're having these global conversations, I think is really important. I have to say I am cautiously optimistic because what I have seen in Scotland is hundreds, perhaps thousands of people across Scotland now feel they have the power to insist that black lives matter, to insist that those in power are accountable for change. And perhaps now, finally, a change is going to come. I'm going to be ever hopeful for that. I should also point out, I, I deliberately used this image because I really think, I know it's a swear word, but I really thought that, that this is um, after the Colson statue was taken down. Um, and this is a young black man um, who rose on top of that statue. And I just love what they've said, you have with the last generation. And I really hope that's to be true. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, well, to make good use of the time, here, I will read my presentation and you can follow it on PowerPoint, okay? Uh, the title, uh, The Black and Racist Movement in contemporary Brazil, uh, remarkable experience and the view of horizon. Okay, uh, thanks for the invitation and congratulations uh, to the event organizers. As the time is short for our initial presentations, I will concentrate on two aspects only which can be dependent later on you, the conversation. First, I will brief characterize the anti-racist struggle in Brazil based on the work of the Black Movement. It has involved a wide range of civil society organization and social movements which historically have struggled against racism in general by critiquing its intellectual foundations by publicly denouncing the way racism has operated through discrimination and violence, and above all, by demanding the implementation of public policies to promote racial equality. Next, I want to highlight some of the most recent characteristics of the Black Movement and Racist Program with respect to gains, difficulties, and challenges. Chief among early gains have been this. Racism was made a crime based on Article 5, Section 42 
of the Brazilian Federal Constitution of 1988. Affirmative action policies were institutionalized, leading to gains in Afro-Brazilian professionalization, in the training of intellectual cadres, uh, and in the production of knowledge that we ourselves have, have created. Federal laws 10639 was approved in 2003, making mandatory the inclusion of African history and of African Brazilian history and culture in Brazilian elementary and secondary schools. Uh, but even though there have not been many really mass protests, the black anti-racist movement has acted frequently and has achieved historic and important victories. I can talk about more of those later in the discussion. As I said before, since I only have a few minutes, I want to highlight two aspects of the Black movement, which stand out today and which are in some way part of international and racist struggle. The first, and perhaps the most important movement today, is the Black women's movement. Achieving autonomy from the general feminist movement, the Black women's movement has attained great victories in a struggle that brings together issues of race, class, gender, and economy and social condition. So black women have given new impulse and innovation to the Black anti-racist movement, expanding conceptions of rights, freedom, democracy, and representation, mainly because they focus on the fight against male supremacy, in particular, taught not only the chauvinism of black men. They also fight against feminicide and in a defense of the lives of the both black women and black men. Another strong form of anti-racist manifestation in Brazil is the Black Youth Movement. Black youth men and women have organized themselves from within their communities and have occupied the political space of struggle and representation. They have specific demands to, such as the fight against the genocide of Black youth. One of the most important aspects of the Black youth movement is that they are changing the way politics is being done. New notions of aesthetics, from natural hair to ways of dressings, of empowered behavior, from original artistic expressions, including music, dance, and poetry, uh, to the self assumption of Black consciousness have changed the meaning of doing politics, politics in Brazil, outside the conventional ways which are traditionally linked to political parties or similar organizations. Well, uh, these are just some of the contemporary aspects of the black and racist struggle in Brazil. We can discuss in more detail during the question and answer period. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, my demonstration. I'm a beginner in uh, English in life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson. And there's no need for um, there's no need for you to apologize at all for um, the difficulty with English. Um, we are doing a global conversation and. Therefore, the question of translation and interpretation and understanding each other is really very important. I want to thank all of you for, the, uh, for, your, for your contributions. And I want to pick up on uh, something that has uh, emerged in some of the uh, presentations. And uh, this is the idea of uh, political blackness, which uh, Francoise uh, puts on the table. And I want to talk, ask a little bit, if you could describe that a little bit more, but also ask Zandro um, about that idea of political blackness. 
because I know that is something that is very, um, is, is very important in the United Kingdom in the 70s and is now important in Scotland um, at, at the present time. So if you could talk a little bit more about this business of political and political blackness, what does that mean, um, uh, Francoise? And then ask Zandro to think a bit about, um, about this business of what does it mean to be black? And how, does she, how, do, how do people understand in Scotland the idea of black rather than being Asian or African or Afro-Caribbean or African? Francoise? Sorry, I was not finding my, <laughs> my okay. microphone. Um, yeah, political blackness, because then, uh, quite quickly, I mean, blackness then does not represent only the question of uh, uh, skin color, which of course is very important because it, but also a position, historical position that has been denied humanity, has been, you know, like historically being de denied the fact of being human and then, then reclaim what is to be human. So in that, for me, when it's political, because it, 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 uh, it made us think of what kind of political organization we, we want, where we, which, uh, which will be, you know, with social justice and the question of reparation, how do we repair the world? How do we repair the earth, which is being destroyed by capitalism and by racial capitalism? So there is a political position that, and therefore it's not just a question of culture or origin. It's really transforming deeply. For me, it's a liberation movement. It's a movement of liberation. Okay, thanks. Zandra? Um, it's interesting because it's such a contentious discussion in Scotland. I mean, us as a, a activist organization, use political black and when I coordinate Black History Month we are encompassing the histories and experiences of African and being an Asian people um, in Scotland and the you know the histories that we share around empire colonialism slate and slavery and migration you know we've all been impacted um, and also the issue about the solidarity. I mean, I'm obviously of a generation as someone who's mixed days with McTrace, with a father from India, a mother from Scotland, you know, where in the 80s it was a sense of solidarity. You know, the political, the term political blackness, black, was, a, was used in solidarity for us to challenge white supremacy, you know, and white ideology and whiteness. And this was what it was about. Now, that doesn't negate people's individual experience because that, you know, people's individual experience um, with regards to racism and, and, you know, that experience is hugely important. But for me, the, the political blackness is about us looking at the collective and looking at the experience you may not have had, but someone else has, and, and it's a bit challenging. Um, Challenging racism, um, you know, from a, a, a more, a bigger perceptive per perception, I suppose. But it is, you know, there's, there's lots of terminology. People spend hours discussing terminology in Scotland. Should it be black? Should it be black minority ethnic? Should it be black Asian minority ethnic? It's, it's something that people spend a lot of a time on. For me personally, I think people should be allowed to use whatever terminology that works for me. Okay. Um, does this arise at all uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, um, Michel, the idea of political blackness? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, similar developments and discussions are, are happening here. Uh, although I think a big difference between the, the Netherlands and the UK, as far as I know, is that in the UK, it was more also, I think, institutionalized. Uh, um, I want to talk about this context. Uh, um, there's a sim similar discussion. Uh, so is black everybody that's not racialized as white or is black people of African descent? And I think in the current generation, I think it's also a generational discussion. Uh, among my generation, blackness predominantly means people of African descent, people racialized as black uh, because 
um, a lot of other minority, quote unquote, or migrant groups do not identify as black. And there's also the issue of anti-blackness within other communities. So um, as I said in my presentation, what has been an interesting development in the last month is that uh, there was a lot of solidarity uh, between different groups. Uh, so you saw uh, uh, there have been opinion uh, articles and, uh, in media of you know, Asian activists talking about anti-blackness within their own communities and within wider society and that they should show solidarity and that their movement you know, benefits from the struggles of black activists. So I think that is a kind of solidarity that uh, in my opinion um, is very you know, constructive. Uh, you know, so that we can see both the similarities and our common struggles, but also you know, acknowledge specific histories and specific systems of oppressions. Uh, so that's, that's where we are at. Okay, both you, both Michelle and Sandra speak of, with a certain hope um, of the, because their governments, whether it's the Prime Minister in Netherlands or the First Minister in Scotland, have uh, made gestures of accommodation um, to, to the movement. I want to ask both of you, um, how, how really hopeful are you both? Um, do you, uh, is this not just a hope that's born of, a, of the certain, of the moment? Um, will it, will you, do you think it will be sustained? Will you not have to go on the streets again? Michel, you can go first if you want. I'll go first? Okay. Yeah, maybe I was a bit too hopeful in the presentation, but yes, I, I, I'm, I'm in the space between hope and sometimes a bit of skepticism, um, uh, especially with the current prime minister. Uh, he's known for, he's literally uh, been prosecuted for racist policies in 2003. Uh, he did, uh, you know, uh, several, he made several racist statements uh, also about Black Pete. Um, so the fact that he, as a person, acknowledge that there's such a thing as systemic racism and that Black Pete has to change after 10 years of, you know, saying the complete opposite was an interesting shift of position. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are skeptic. We were not, so he invited protesters, Black Lives Matter, but he randomly, you know, just picked a few people who nobody knew from the community. So, we published a statement in which we said, you know, Marco Luther, that's his name. Marco Luther doesn't care about black people and this is just a photo up for him. Um, and yeah, that was picked up by media and then he invited us. So we're not even, you know, sure if it's, you know, uh, uh, helpful to talk to him. But when we look at other developments, I think that does, you know, give some signs of hope in the sense that the number of people that went out on the streets um, and the shift in the public discourse, even in mainstream media, um, other political parties who invited us and um, yeah, you know, showed willingness and openness to yeah, think and implement new policies. But yeah, we, there is the necessary skepticism so on the one hand, we'll develop the manifesto. And on the other hand, we said, okay, we also want to develop a black manifesto, which is something in which we want to, you know, make a few points about, okay, what can we do ourselves as a community? Uh, because all these politicians have been and still are part of the problem that we're trying to fight against. So there are signs of hope, but at the same time, there's some, you know, skepticism. Zandra? Um, I did say I was cautiously optimistic. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess you can't do this work without hope. You know, I mean, we, we have to, because um, I always think that I'm a bit, I come across when I talk about the work I do and, and you know, anti-racism, like I'm always really negative. So, you know, because, it, you know, it's not a great story. It, it's, it's, there's nothing great happening. It's, it's awful. I mean, the situation is, is awful. Um, what happened with the current global gaze 
um, or trend, whatever you want to, to put it, um, governments such as the Scottish government, every politician stood up and, you know, for the first time, just over two hours, despite us as an organisation getting something like 50 motions put on the table at the parliament, we have never seen more than two hours where politicians were actually speaking about racism and its existence and the fact that Black Lives Matter and that there's such a thing as structural racism. So that in itself makes me feel really hopeful because enough was said in that room, you know, enough statements for us to, to use, you know, to put forward, remember when you said this, remember when you thought Black Lives Matter, re remember this, you know, we continue to, to be very public about that because there's not any other way for us to take it forward. But on a much more positive note, taking the politicians out of it, what we did see was many people paying attention starting to think about what books they should be reading, about educating themselves, about people putting their own, um, you know, well, I'm not always an advocate of this. I always think you should get behind things that are existing. But when people have, you know, been putting their own kind of campaigns forward, challenging our education system, you know, wanting to support the fact that we, we do need a national museum that tells the honest, honest truth about our complicity direct involvement in slavery and colonialism when you're seeing that coming you know, swell from the ground that makes me extremely positive and extremely hopeful and yes we will lose some of these people because they'll get distracted by other things but some people will come on this journey with us so i'm going to be very hopeful of it <laughs> okay thanks andrew uh francoise i how do you see it i mean because french republicanism has a long legacy, a long tradition in which to talk about race, the French would tell you, is actually to create racism, which is obviously a lot of nonsense. And so I'm, you are sitting at, in a country, in, if the Dutch say they are tolerant, the French kind of Republican universalism obscures any kind of um, anti, any kind of anti-racist activity. And that seems to be a huge um, drawback to the kind of work that you and others have to do. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you see that? How do you, how do you, what kind of me methods you think you might need to, to penetrate that, that real veil of, of, um, of republicanism that obscures what France really is? I think it's gonna be very, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, really, if I'm honest, I mean, the elite, academic elite, the media, political, economic, they don't want to hear about race at all. There is no racism in France, okay? None whatsoever. So that's gonna be very, I think it's gonna be very difficult. There is really something at stake for the Republic, or left and the left and right, same thing at stake if they recognize that there is racism within the Republic is as if, you know, they have to give up the Republic altogether, right? And don't forget, for instance, when we intervene uh, in front of statue of Gagliani and Bujo who are criminal, you know, colonial criminal, um, even left historians say, you should not put this statue down. Because I think that for them, they are, they are bastard, they are criminal, but they are members of the family of the white family, right? And so who are we to say, no, this should go away, right? Because, okay, they are bad, but they are ours, right? And who are you people to tell us, you know, who should be there in the public space? I think, and, and they are criminalizing even anti-racist attitude. Uh, people have been censored, you know, invitation has been uh, canceled for some of us, you know, in the university. Uh, we are regularly attacked on, on social network, but also in petition that are published by the national newspaper. I, I do say, but I also as, as, as was said, you know, a lot of young people now are doing their own stuff, question of co-education, self-education, auto-education, it's happening. And that is slowly, but I will say that one of the uh, really 
deep question is slavery, is racial slavery. More than colonialism is slavery. There is a denial of the importance of slavery in the making of France, of French society, culture, literature, you know, laws, philosophy, deep. It's as if colonialism can be recognized, colonization was bad, blah, 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 blah. even Macron said it's a crime against humanity with absolutely no consequence whatsoever after that. But the point, but slavery, the, 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 the importance of slavery in the making of modernity, in the making of the world that France is part of, will be the most difficult. But it's also difficult in the anti-racist movement. Also, it's not just, it's, it's very difficult because it, it's a peer. I think there is still a lot of work to be done of education to be done about slavery, not just being about torture, about, you know, the chain and the whip, but also the question of the resistance, what emerged also, the, the long resistance, the constant resistance. There was, you know, very often, and even from people from, the, you know, um, uh, I hear everyone was for slavery then, right? To the mode in France. And I said, no, no not, not everyone the enslaved from the first day fought back. So not everyone, but there is this notion of everyone, of this universalism, as you say, when one becomes the universe, you know, one becomes the universal. And I think it's gonna be a long battle. It's a long battle, it's a long battle, not only in France, but also in Europe. And not, uh, I mean, we see also neo-fascism emerging everywhere mm -hmm. in Europe. I mean, this is not, this is not just a marginal fact. So there is something connected. And about fascism, the connection, again, I want to go back to Aimé Césaire, the connection of the colonial roots the, of racism, uh, of fascism, sorry, of fascism. You know, that fascism, the, the, the narrative is like, was born in Europe, Nazi, Mussolini, Hitler, but they have colonial roots, colonial roots, and these roots are really within the racial racism in the colony. And that will be dis too disturbing for, you know, for, and this movement of incredible, um, we, ha we will have to fight. But as, as, uh, as Sandra was saying, a lot of young people now, it's very, you see, they, they take their own tools, they do their own stuff because, you know, the, if they are waiting, uh, they can, they, nothing will happen. But the, the, the fight is very, I mean, I, I, I think the fight going to be uh, tougher and tougher. And there is really uh, just a criminalization mm -hmm. of anti-racism, the way they criminalize, you know, uh, the critic against Israel as being anti-Semitism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say there will be a possibility of criminalizing anti-racism by saying it's separatism, right? And distinguishing good anti-racism versus bad anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. I want to turn to, uh, to Wilson to bring Wilson in. Um, uh, um, Wilson, you are living under a, um, a, a regime that is very um, it's a right-wing regime, it's authoritarian, um, Bolsonaro. So I want to ask you, how does, um, how does, how does the anti-racist struggles um, in Brazil manage against um, this regime um, at, this, at this point in time? O Tony está a perguntar como é que o vivendo num regime direitista e muito racista no Brasil neste momento, como é que o, os membros, os participantes na luta antiracista, racista, como é que eles estão a agir, estão a, a tratar ou lidar com essa questão de, de, de lutar debaixo do regime Bolsonaro? Bem, eu acho que nós vivemos uma situação bastante peculiar, né? O regime de extrema direita de um governo que foi eleito recentemente com 58 milhões de votos, que tem uma certa legitimidade popular, 
mas que, que tem criado sérias dificuldades para os movimentos sociais, é, não só da luta antirracista. Qualquer luta que implica a ampliação dos direitos, as conquistas, etc. So the, the, the situation in Brazil, he says, is, is rather peculiar uh, politically. Um, first, yes, it's an extreme right government. It's an extreme right government that was elected with a fairly large popular vote. And so that is presenting serious difficulties, not just to the black movement, but to any social movement, to any movement that's trying to widen the question of of rights and to fight against discrimination and violence, any any social movement. So it's a very difficult situation for the black anti-racist movement right now. E as dificuldades são maiores ainda na medida em que o governo Bolsonaro, o atual governo, está retirando as conquistas sociais e mesmo as conquistas da luta antirracista é que foram conseguidas a duras penas durante regimes políticos anteriores, né? Durante, por exemplo, os governos do PT, o governo do presidente Lula e o governo da presidente Dilma, os movimentos negros tiveram, as populações negras de modo geral, tiveram uma série de conquistas institucionais, uma série de garantias de direitos, né? e esses direitos estão paulatinamente sendo retirados um a um pelo governo Bolsonaro. And there's an even greater problem under the Bolsonaro regime. Previously, um, at great cost and due to struggle, the various uh, social movements and segments of the population managed to, to gain some social rights, some social protections, some affirmative action, uh, some things to protect the environment. But under the Bolsonaro regime, those rights, those gains from prior social movements are being taken away one by one. Uh, e os movimentos sociais, sobretudo os movimentos negros, vêm encontrando sérias dificuldades de operação. Sobretudo porque aqui, como em todo o mundo, com essa situação da pandemia e com as proibições, com o isolamento, as determinações da Organização Mundial de Saúde de isolamento, de evitar aglomerações, uh, está sendo muito difícil para articular essa luta antifascista contra o Bolsonaro, porque... A população brasileira já não tem muita tradição de grandes organizações de massa. Né? A nossa tradição é por outro tipo de movimentação, uma movimentação mais, mais setorizada, mais localizada na conquista, na luta por esses direitos. Mas agora está ficando cada vez mais difícil por conta também né, juntar ao governo Bolsonaro essas proibições uh, ocasionadas aí pela pandemia. Something else that has made it difficult for social movements to, or anti-black racism movements and social movements in general to operate right now in Brazil is precisely the pandemic. With the injunction to, to, to isolate socially, it has made it rather difficult, more difficult for an alliance, say, of anti-fascist, anti-Bolsonaro movements and formations. Uh, Brazil doesn't have a long, a long history of giant mass movements because the, the way that the struggle has unfolded has been a lot more localized and directly related to, to particular issues and local issues. So with the pandemic, with the restrictions that have been enacted, it has become even more difficult to, to wage the struggle. E para finalizar, a alternativa que os movimentos sociais de modo geral e o movimento negro vem encontrando para Uh, levar adiante as nossas agendas de reivindicações, de lutas, de conquistas de direito, é fazendo um largo uso uh, dos meios tecnológicos e informacionais. Nós temos algumas, algumas organizações do movimento negro que são especialistas no uso dessas ferramentas e têm conseguido algumas conquistas através uh, de ações junto ao, ao judiciário, de ações junto ao legislativo. Agora, de organizações de massa uh, está praticamente uh, paralisado aqui no Brasil. Né? So what the black movement has done, the black movement and other movements have done uh, in the current situation is turn to the use of technological means. And in the black movement, we have specialists who are now masters there, 
or have mastered this technology and they've been able to continue mobilization and certain kinds of actions, court cases, legislation, et cetera, by making ample use of uh, digital technologies now more than ever. But there's still the problem of mass organizing. Mass organizing right now is very difficult. Thank you. All right. Um, they, I really want to thank all the panelists for really very important uh, conversation and, and interventions. And I would like to now turn over to the audience and participants with, uh, for your questions for the next uh, 35 minutes or so. Uh, Catherine, can you begin the questions, please? Yes, of course. We had uh, two kind of similar questions come in from James and Nairuti. So they're asking, how do issues of race converge or differ across cultural, political, and national contexts? Do issues of structural racism operate similarly across borders? And what role does a colonial history and cultural differences play in these distinct constructions of race? Okay, um, we, uh, Francoise, you want to take that, followed by Zandra and, uh, and Mitchell? Yeah, I do think um, that colonial history matter in the making. Uh, not necessarily, but at the same time, it's very difficult to say that because I'm afraid to insist on, on difference when in fact we're going to find a lot of similarity quite often. Uh, but it, it, it depends, I would say depend of the attitude of the society towards the colonial past and towards slavery. That will be perhaps. Um, because, I mean, if I look at France, but if we could look at as, as Spain and Portugal, in Spain and Portugal, there is absolutely no conversation about slavery, none. So it's uh, Portugal has no conversation about slavery. So the question of the conversation and the question then of how anti-blackness racism operate and how this is being fought against. I know that in Portugal now, you have a lot of movement and coming back also to bring back that, that history. So, I'm, it's, I, as soon as I find a, a difference, I find a similarity. So, I, I, will, I, don't, I don't know. What I can say is like everywhere, black people are not received with flowers and garlands. Zandra? Um, I probably forget half of that question, but um, just to follow on from Francois, Francois, I think you see here in Scotland, so we'll look at the United States and there's, there's an acceptance that there's anti-black racism in America. There's an acceptance you know, that that's something that exists there. Um, you've seen the the, 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 the politics of the United States viewed here in the UK, you know, very, very dismissive. People will march in Glasgow against Trump before they marched against any of our own politicians. And some of our own politicians have similar politics and policy ideas, which has always been a kind of issue. And I think one of the reasons that happens is we're very comfortable saying the problem is over there. Now, with regards to slavery and colonialism, it has taken us 20 years to get people in Scotland to really, really get involved in the fact that Scotland was complicit and actively involved in the enslavement of African people. And that we live in a city that they are very comfortable saying it's the second city of the empire without actually really thinking through, well, what does that actually mean? And also through telling these stories, which is really important, we have to address that legacy. And the legacy is the continued structural racism that is threaded through our societies. Um, I think the other thing about that is everybody likes to think they're good people. And the, and the problem we have is people think they have an idea in their head of what a racist person is. And it's someone that calls out names, uses bad language around, you know, um, black people, or, you know, you know, maybe, you know, they, they see it as an action, as something that they 
you know, towards a person, whether it's violence or language or whatever, they don't understand that they can be complicit in structural racism within their own institutions and within how the institutions function. So we in Scotland have had a real problem with getting um, our society and the people um, who create policy and, and laws to understand their own biases and their own prejudices and racism um, against black people. So I, I went on there, so I don't know if I've answered that question. I think I was just trying to throw so much at you. Okay. All right, Zan. No, that's, no, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Mitchell, you want to take a swing at that? Yeah, sure. Um, good question. It's something uh, we've been thinking about as well. Um, I think, first of all, it's important to uh, acknowledge at least that's our vision that, you know, uh, race is a European export product. Yeah? It did not start in the U.S., but, uh, uh, um, yeah, was brought to the rest of the world and developed and manifested itself in different ways, including the U.S. I think the key difference between the U.S. and European uh, countries is that slavery took place on U.S. soil whilst in the context of European countries, it was, quote unquote, far away in the colonies. And so it was far away of the, the, the uh, you know, the public consciousness, far away of the common people, whilst in the US, you know, they could not really escape it. Um, second thing I think is simple, you know, demographics, numbers. Yeah? When you look at the number of African-American people compared to the number of uh, black people in Europe, especially when you talk about the Netherlands, you know, there are big differences as well. And we're talking about millions in the US, I don't know the exact percentage, but when we talk about the Dutch context, um, there are 17 million approximately in total. And of those 17 million, uh, between 600,000 to 1 million are people of African descent. Yeah? So that's quite, a very limited that's a very limited number um and uh, related to that i think i mean look at the histories of black emancipation movements it's very important um in our archive we see that and uh, let's let's say 100 years ago there were literally a few hundred black people in the netherlands whilst now yeah, we were talking about a few hundred thousand Compared to the United States, 100 years ago, you already had, you know, the movement, uh, the NAACP, uh, and different kinds of black radical movements advocating for, um, you know, black history becoming part of the public uh, public memory, uh, such as Negro History Week of Carter G. Woodson. So I think those factors all play a role, and you know, things are starting to change and shift across Europe as well. Um, but there are similarities and essential differences. Wilson. Ok. Uh, essa situação do Brasil também é bastante característica. O Brasil, como todos devem saber, uh, foi um país escravista durante quase 400 anos. E a forma como as elites antigas, elites escravistas, elites dominantes, fizeram a transição do regime de escravidão para o regime de liberdade, eh, eles inteligentemente mantiveram todas as formas de eh, dominação anteriores, lançando mão eh, de expedientes de perpetuação dessa dominação. Um dos expedientes mais inteligentes foi a ideia de democracia racial, de que no Brasil apesar das diferenças raciais reconhecidas, não haveria desigualdade. Brasil presents a, a very interesting case. Brasil was a slave society for nearly 400 years. When the old, what's important is to understand how the old elites made the transition from slavery to freedom. They maintained all the dispositions, all the structure of slavery, but with but able to say that because there was no legal discrimination, Brazil was then had become something called a racial democracy, in which no racism and no well no racism exists because it's a racial democracy. And he says that this was a very uh, 
insidious and clever form of making the transition from slavery to freedom that wasn't really a transition. E o, o processo de transição é, de um sistema de trabalho escravo para um regime de trabalho livre e também de uma de, do império para uma república que coincidiu, a abolição da escravidão foi em 1888 e a proclamação da república foi no ano seguinte, 1889, mas ao longo de todo o século, pelo menos da segunda metade do século XIX, quando se encerra o tráfico internacional de escravos, as elites vão adotando procedimentos que vão garantindo a exclusão dessas populações que vão sendo libertadas paulatinamente dos fóruns da cidadania. A exemplo de uma legislação específica em 1850, chamada Lei de Terras, que proíbe as populações negras de ter propriedade de terra. So, uh, continuing with the, with the explanation of how Brazil made the transition from slave workers to free workers, and also how Brazil made the transition from empire to republic, both of which took place late in the 19th century. So slavery wasn't abolished till 1888, and the full republic came about in 1889. They continued uh, to cleverly create certain kinds of dispositions and structures that maintain the old system with, res with regard to its effect. So for example, there was a law passed in 1870, which was called the land law, which prohibited black people from owning land. Para finalizar, é, é, esse processo de transição, ah, embora o Brasil tenha se transformado em uma nação republicana e livre, ah, as populações negras não foram é, integradas. As elites, apesar de acabar com a escravidão, mantiveram ah, todos os expedientes necessários para se manter no poder até a atualidade, de forma que a luta antirracista, mesmo a luta antirracista contemporânea, é, se escreve no âmbito dessa tradição de dificuldades. A dificuldade de fazer a, as elites entenderem é, que as populações negras a, são portadoras de direitos iguais a ela. Então, essa mentalidade escravista ainda permanece na história do Brasil. So, with respect to this transition, it's important to realize that the transition from slavery to freedom was done in such a way that the black population, although legally, technically freed, was not integrated into a new kind of regime, that the old elites did everything that they needed to do to structure their being maintained in power. Today, there is still this mentality, this kind of slavery mentality, particularly among the Brazilian elites. The elites, they do not see black people as the bearers of rights. And this shadow, this difficulty still hangs over anti-racist organizing today in Brazil. Would you say, therefore, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Gusto, you could answer this as well, please, that, they, that in Brazil, um, just as it, quite frankly, as in France, but in perhaps in a different way, that the, one of the real and key difficulties to think about anti-black racism and organizing in, in, uh, in these places is in fact the question of slavery. Wilson, o Tony pergunta se então será no Brasil como na, na, na França a dificuldade, uma das dificuldades enormes de organizar eh, toda uma movimentação social eh, contra o racismo, anti-negro, racismo, é essa questão eh, não resolvida ainda de escravidão? Sem a menor dúvida, eu acho que a escravidão ainda compõe essa memória né, na, na história do Brasil, não só uma memória, ela se institui como uma cultura. Quer dizer, a, o domínio senhorial patriarcal, que é a herança da escravidão, se perpetua ao longo da história. E aí, adicionado a isso, ainda nós temos a, a, a interiorização cultural da ideia de democracia racial, que faz com que uma grande parte da população negra, mesmo da população negra, não consiga enxergar o racismo. Né? Mesmo a população negra, uma dificuldade enorme de enxergar o racismo por conta desse formato muito peculiar que nós herdamos da escravidão, dessa dinâmica de relações raciais Desigual. Ela é inclusiva, ela inclui, 
mas ela inclui subordinando, ela inclui na nacionalidade brasileira, inclui os negros na nacionalidade brasileira, mas de uma forma subordinada, de uma forma onde, é, onde os direitos não são observados. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is the question of slavery unresolved that is, is, um, that is creating a big problem with respect to anti-racist struggle, anti-freedom struggle in, in Brazil. The politicians have, have uh, made use of that notion of Brazil being a racial democracy. And even for some people, they are still under the kind of delusion that Brazil is a racial democracy. And so it makes it difficult sometimes to do organizing around racism in the country that denies that racism exists. And yes, that shadow of slavery, the unresolved shadow of slavery is part of the difficulty. And this concept of racial democracy, which even some black Brazilians still subscribe to and still don't understand or have not fully understood how that circumscribes their rights. They've been included in the society, but they haven't been included in the rights that a citizen has the right to in society. They're, they're Brazilians by nationality, but not by all of the rights that they should have. But let me ask you a question, Juri, because uh, you are, you know, you, you know Brazil uh, to a very large degree, and you have you are born, you, you are, you are African-American. Both countries do not acknowledge slavery. So, but what's the, what's the difference between both? What do you mean both countries do not acknowledge slavery? In other words, both, country, both countries' elites do not engage in a hard story that acknowledges slavery as part of their past. I mean, there's a way in which people try to elide racial slavery as uh, the foundation of each of these, uh, of each of these places. Are you talking about France and Brazil or the United States? I'm talking States about the United States and Brazil. So what's the similarities, what's the differences? As somebody who has, who, has, who has experienced both. There I have to say, like Francois says, the more you try to think of differences, if you look at what really happens, how people really live from day to day, the differences are, you know, the differences rhetorically or in an abstract way exist, but in the day-to-day -day lives of ordinary black people, those differences don't, don't exist. I think that it was important that in the United States that a civil war was fought in which keeping slaves slaves was, was a central issue. And that wasn't the case in the history of Brazil. But as far as experiencing day-to-day -day racism in the way black people live, uh, I, I don't see the big difference in, uh, you know, in Brazil. It's, um, you know, there's a conceptual apparatus about color and about being mixed and so forth. But if you, as you would know from the United States, Jamaica, Reunion, the Netherlands, or anywhere else, the story of Black people who are mixed, not a story just for Latin America or Brazil. They placed it ideologically in a certain kind of, you know, place or category. But Black people mixed with Europeans, you know, and then other people that were brought later on in, you know, once slavery was over, but to bring people in involuntary servitude, this happened everywhere there was slavery. So at bottom, you know, even though there are differences in how the history rolls out, I tend to agree with Francoise that the day-to-day -day life for ordinary Black people, whether it's in Brazil or anywhere else, Black people are at the tend to, if there's a racial, if there's a racial pyramid constructed by racial capital, black people are at the bottom of that pyramid. Okay, thanks. Catherine, can we get another question, please? Yes, this question comes from Camilla. Camilla says, the COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized structural inequalities that have persisted for centuries and the structural racism that allows these inequalities to be perpetrated. So how do the panelists see the fight for a right to health, especially in a time of weak multilateralism and extreme right attempts to delegitimize those deliberative spaces, such as the, the World Health Organization? Anybody wants to go first? Okay, well. Francois. Okay, Francois. okay. 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 sorry. Um, well, I do think it's a very important point, a very, very important point. Uh, in 2015, there was a big uh, epidemic also in Réunion Island, Chikungunya, and uh, which killed a lot of people for a small island. But the point of the pandemic itself is not enough. It's because people had diabetes, 
uh, you know, uh, and all the problem, else problem. So there was a long history of, you know, like else is, is one for me of one of the most, one of the very important uh, measure of racism, of structural racism. It's not just a consequence, it's really at the heart. The point of, uh, of um, I mean, slavery was what? Like uh, yeah, really premature death, I mean, killing people, I mean, that not health. And there is a legacy of that, very strong legacy. So how to overcome that? And, uh, and the World Health Organization, but even the World Health Organization has not been always, you know, like the best things in terms of policy for Africa or Asia. I do think that we uh, that the uh, that health is a is a very important field that we have to reappropriate in the anti-racist struggle. It's really no, and not just you know uh, the question of disease, but the me uh, mental health, you know, psych psychic damage and wounds, you know, produced by racism. It has to be a very central. Racism kills not only because of police violence, but kills also through this uh, disease. So to, to take, you know, the question of disease and, and the, as effectively a project of racism seems to me very important. And it's not just through international organization, though it's very important to, to effectively give uh, the World Health Organization all the, the, the resources it needs but it has to be also in terms of research and formation. We do know that racism exists in the health institution, that black doctors, black researchers are not effectively treated as, so there is, it's absolutely the structure of health which is very hierarchical, very pyramidal, but at the same time in the low paid job, low qualified, you find again, black women taking care. So the caring is still being done, you know, by, women of color. So the, the health things for me is as the, whether it's research, whether it's pharmaceutical company, whether what kind of disease are being really being financed, you know, like what research is being financed and what are not, all of these are really a field when you, you can see structural racism. Thanks, Francois. Jerry? Um, I think this is an important uh, question time to put in something about the movement for Black Lives. One of the things that's most impressive to those of us who are older and more or less retired from certain kinds of street protests is the way that movement for Black Lives here in the United States is actually looking at, I think I read in one of the beginning quotes, these are all connected up struggles. And because we're in the moment of the pandemic or the syndemic, of course, the inequities in health and health care and in who dies and who doesn't and who can be quarantined or so safely isolating at home and who can't are all connected to racism, connected to racial capitalism, connected to the environment. The young person that I quoted said it's a connected up struggle. So one of the things that's impressive to me and that I wish that, um, you know, I'm hoping people will spend lot more time doing. I, I recall that I said we need to spend more time reading the actual platforms and policy statements and the, the ideas and conceptual discussions that young activists are having all over the world and particularly with respect to uh, anti-racism and anti-police violence and the questions of health inequalities is what are they putting forward? So I mentioned the BREED Act. I won't talk about it now but I think that if people who are interested in this question of health and how it can be looked at broadly in a connected up way that contemplates racism, that contemplates economic justice as well as racial justice, environmental justice, you might take a look at it. It's pretty short, 13 pages, it's a platform, but I'm a big advocate of we need to pay attention to the ideas, not just the protests and the demonstrations in the street, which are very important, but what are they proposing? They're thinking their way to a different kind of future. And even if it's some of it may not be attainable now, I think they're putting on public agendas nationally and internationally a way to think about these things. 
but I'll just recommend the Breed Act and looking at it with respect to uh, this question that was posed about health. Okay, Catherine, can we get uh, two more questions? We have about seven minutes left. Yeah, absolutely. The next question comes from Valerie, who is an educator and says, I'm particularly interested in how to reverse the structural racism that is still affecting our children in schools and their equitable opportunities. For example, during this pandemic year, children in America with darker skin were more likely to be less connected to the internet. Michelle, I know you, I know you work with school children. You yeah, um, yeah, very good question. I briefly wanted to touch upon the, the former one because it's related to the question. Uh, okay, go ahead, because, please. Because um, uh, health is a big issue here as well. Uh, but the problem that we have here is that issues like race is not registered. So we see it in our environment, like, hey, you know, a lot of people are being affected by uh, COVID-19, but we don't have the statistics. So without the statistics, it's also hard to make a case. So one of the things that we are pushing for is to uh, yeah, register uh, uh, things based on uh, race. So yeah, you can actually uh, you know, uh, develop policies to address these issues. Uh, in regards to education, I think it's a very good question. Uh, one of the big problems uh, in the Dutch context and I think a lot of other countries as well is the lack of education. Uh, around colonial history, histories of slavery, histories of you know race, racism, etc. Uh, one of the things I'm very uh, optimistic about, as I said before, were uh, that a lot of young people joined the protest in the streets. I'm, I'm already you know young, but we're like teenagers. One of the things that happened was that uh, three young black girls uh, set up a petition. And they got more than 60,000 uh, people who signed it within a few days uh, because of social media and the way that they are connected. And in the Dutch context, if you set up a petition which gets at least 40,000 uh, petitions, it has to be discussed in the parliament. And within a few weeks, it was picked up by one of the left wing political parties and adopted with the majority. Um, and the motion, as they call it there, uh, stated that racism has to be uh, discussed at primary and secondary school um, in, yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the whole country. So that's a very positive development. A second positive development, uh, one of you mentioned it as well, is that we saw a lot of people, white people saying, hey, you know, we should not just wait on schools, but also educate ourselves, uh, you know, sharing lists and things like that. And one of the good things is that this book, I uh, fit right there, it's a book by Anton Lecom. He was the first Surinamese man who wrote critically about slavery. It's called We Slaves of Suriname. Uh, it was banned and censored for a very long time, uh, published in 1934. A uh, new edition was published this week. And today uh, we got the news that it's on the, in the top 30 of bestsellers. So, yeah, those are a few develop positive developments that I see. And the third one is that, um, yeah, what we are doing with the Black Archives is getting a lot of attention as well. Um, so, yeah, one of the things that we want to push for through this manifesto, which is partly inspired by this platform for Black Lives, uh, is to push for a change in the educational system and the curricula. Uh, but we do know that you know it's hard to change these institutions so we try to do it from both sides an institutional level but also what we can do ourselves Great. thanks very much can we take a final question catherine yeah the final question how then can we equip young activists with the tools and benefits of the experience of seasoned activists that's a good question and can i ask uh, can we begin with zandra yes. Okay, can I also backtrack a wee bit and, and make some response to the other questions? I'll be very quick. Yeah, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. One about health. So in the UK, we have the National Health Service. It's not free because we pay for it through our wages. So I pay a national insurance contribution uh, every month, like my salary. I've done for years and I'm more than happy to do that for people who don't earn a salary. That's National Health Service works because they always talk about us having free healthcare, but we actually pay for it. The reason I mention that is 
It's being used as a tool. It's being used in immigration, for instance, is being used um, to try and dismantle our, our National Health Service. So this thing about influx of migrants coming to our country, the, the, you know, the racism that's attached to that, where uh, they are impacting on our health service is really problematic. And you're, it's, it, that's a real scare, actually not having free health care, especially for people who are black because there is that issue about overcrowding, poverty, lots of other issues where health inequalities um, really stands out. Something um, Mitchell said that we had been dealing with here also was data recording, so the, the recording of, of ethnicities um, and during the pandemic has been really problematic, but we have actually again challenged that with the government and there has been a current report. So, we're seeing better data, not exact data, but better data about the impact that this current COVID-19 has on um, particular black and minority ethnic communities that live in Scotland. So we have that information. Um, with regards to the question about um, schools and communication and internet and tech, that I think the question kind of related to that, having access to communication tools like the internet, as well as the issues of structural racism. One of the things that we did when the pandemic happened was work with all the, the networks, the community groups that are frontline black, um, communities. And the thing that really flagged up was the lack of access to internet and telephones and other kind of communication devices that everybody takes for granted because it, in all our libraries, you know, everything had locked down. So where people can get these access, access, whether it's school or libraries, that was all gone. So that really showed up the structures within our society where there's people from particular communities that are not having access to be able to even communicate, never mind getting access to homeschooling, which is something that was happening here. I'm not sure how that worked in the United States. And I think it's Mitchell pointed out the structural racism. In Scotland anyway, we need to educate the educators because the educators themselves will not acknowledge that structural racism exists. They do not allow children from early years onwards to actually when they say, oh, so-and-so has said this or, or she said that. When a child, even a young child is saying something racist, the educators don't deal with it. And then that black child grows up with that experience of every time I say someone is doing something or saying something that is dismissed or diminished and not addressed. And then people reach adulthood, it's much more harder, more difficult to actually challenge racism when you in employment. So for us in Scotland, one of the things we're looking at is overhaul of the education system even further back than the teachers, but what are we teaching the teachers? And actually teaching them about racism, about anti-racist, about um, the history from slavery and colonialism. We've got a lot of work to do here, a lot of work with regards to right. Well, I want to thank you all very much because we have, we have to wrap up, we have a minute left. Let me just say that I would like to thank all the panelists for very provocative and interesting and I think very important information for the, uh, for the audience. I would love to, I would really would like to thank the audience um, for staying with us right through until uh, the very end. Thank you very, very much. Again, apologies if we couldn't get to all your questions. Um, we have all your questions and one of the things we are trying to do is to make almost like a a question bank, a list of all the questions that we get on these webinars so that we, over time, we can try and answer them. I would like to, obviously, as I close, to thank the, to thank the Watson, um, to thank Ellen White, to thank Media Services, Kyle, uh, Clue, and, um, and Lois, to thank Catherine, Maya, and Shana from the CSS um, uh, staff, and to really thank again all of you um, for for um, for staying with us for the for these uh, for the for these two hours. All I can say to you is uh, 
have a good evening for those of you on this side of the Atlantic. Have a good night for those of you who are across the Atlantic in Europe. And if you're in Brazil, you can still have a good evening if I understand the, the, the time difference uh, properly. So good evening, good night, good late evening to you all and uh, goodbye and thank you all very, very much for what I think is a very important uh, global discussion.